G'day guys and welcome to the Rural Dad Movement first, very first podcast show. Uh, exciting times, something I've wanted to do for a long time and uh, here we are, very first episode. So I thought what I'd talk about today with our very first episode of Rural Dad Movement is myself, my background, I guess my why, which is something that people dive into a fair bit these days and stories, everyone's all about their stories and storytelling. So sharing a little bit about myself, shedding some light on who Alex Renieri is and who he continues to become and strive forth to be in uh, this wonderful thing that we all call life. So welcome guys, I do appreciate your time and effort whether you're listening to this on a podcast channel or watching this right now on YouTube. Uh, exciting stuff. I'm pumped to be doing this. I'm going to be doing this a lot more for you guys, just giving as much value as I can moving forward to help you see the world through a different lens. That's what I'm all about. My life is passion and people and my passion is people. Sorry. And that's something that I just, it really hits me to the core in having that belief that we can all be better. We can all strive for more in our lives, strive for that level of greatness inside of us that truly does exist. And it is all there. You absolutely have it. So please know that, understand that. And deep down, have that level of belief and certainty that you can create anything that you want to in this world. So let's dive into uh, Big Al, Big Red, uh, who he was, who he is, and who he continues to become. Uh, look, guys, a bit of background on myself. My father's full Italian. He came over when he was young. Mum's Australian, so hence the last name Ranieri or Ranieri or Ranieri, Ranieri, whatever. I've heard them all. There's many of them. The Italians, the Wogs, they certainly love vowels, don't they? But uh, yes, growing up with a family of three other brothers, so four boys in our family. I'm number three. I have two older brothers and one younger brother. And uh, yes, what a household it was. What a life full of experiences. Uh, sport was something we were massive on, thanks to mum and dad being quite uh, athletic in themselves through uh, netball. Mum was mum's six foot, so she was a, a state netballer and dad's um, very gifted with AFL rugby and, and cricket back in the day. So it was, um, it was good to see that they had that influence on us early on. And I uh, started soccer when I was three. So by the time I was in under sixes, um, being a strapping big lad that I was, uh, I dominated it. It was good fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I have a few memories, not when I was three, but when I was six and seven and onwards playing soccer and cricket as well, two sports that I grew up with. I, I love them. And, and look, we grew up in a loving home. It was absolutely filled with love and, uh, and energy and lots of crazy times too. You know, we've all got stuff going on and there's, there's always something happening and um, good and bad times alike. It really was a, a loving home and, and the platform from which mum and dad laid for me and my brothers to have that level of belief in, in doing and, and striving for whatever we want in this world. And I remember dad saying that to me when I said, I want to play cricket for Australia, dad, when I was younger. And he said, uh, he said, son, you can do anything in this world if you put your mind to it. And that's held true and rung true with me with everything in my life that I've done that I'll dive into. One of the hardest parts of my life though was uh, you know, all the love for food, you know, and it was a tough period of my life between eight and 15. I was heavily overweight and it really struck me. I blew out to 114 kilos when I was 12 years old. And I guess by some standards that's considered obese. And yeah, I had some muscle in my body. I was still trying to be active, but geez, that was, that was a big boy, you know, at that age. And it really rocked me hard, you know, like the bullying and, and, and what I faced in, in the opposite sex, obviously no girls were really interested in me and I had that lack of confidence and belief in myself um, through those teenage years and, uh, you know, getting picked on, which is, is something that seems to be a standard um, across the board in all cultures of, of life. It's something that really hurt me, um, rocked me deep. I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it now, some tough periods of my life and I remember like carving in my desk at home that I hated myself and, and I'm useless and, and I won't achieve anything. And, you know, looking at myself in the mirror coming home from school at days and just looking and screaming myself saying, you know, you're a useless piece of, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, I'm not massive on, on, on swearing, but yeah, you know, I said those things and, and looked in the mirror and they were some really tough times in my life. And it's something which is ultimately I look back on as a blessing. But when I, when I look back on as well, I feel like my life was balancing on a bit of a knife, um, you know, on a knife's edge, could have gone one way or the other, to be fair. And that's something that, holds true to me I'll never forget and I'll never stop forgetting and, and having that point of reflection as I move forward in my life and it was funny that that time I started weights when I was 13 dad put some some weights in the garage and we had a, a pretty cool little gym garage set up and got me a couple of books and said you go start lifting and my older brother Tim was a PT as well 
at the time. So he certainly helped me. My oldest brother, Matt, was getting into some training as well. So that sparked me, but I was still pretty overweight for those couple of years while trying to do some weights and, and loving food and cordial and eating McDonald's and all the, all the shit food and, um, you know, in excess. And something inside of me clicked at the age of 15 and a half, uh, just after the year 2000. And um, it really struck home with me in, in going there's something more, there's something more to life. You've got something deep down. You've, you've got a gift that you can offer the world. There's, there's greatness in you that you can achieve. Just, just, you can do it out. And so I gave up soft drink and junk food and cordial. They were three massive things for me, massive part of my life and gave those up. And then uh, the next step was I went down to the local soccer park and started running laps, just seeing how many laps I could run. And I got up to 23 in a short period of time, just built bit by bit. I'm not sure of the length of the, the fields are hundred meters, roughly both both sides and I think about 50 to 70 um, across. So looking at 300 metres, about that five, six K run I finally got to and heading into my years when I was 16, the weights started to lift the intensity a little bit more. Like I believe in resistance training for everyone. I mean, kids can do push-ups and pull-ups. There's no reason why I can't grab some form of resistance, whether it's a light dumbbell or kettlebell or something. And, uh, you know, but I started to up the ante a little bit heading into uh, the years when I was 16 and then started to trim down a little bit and then into 17, got fitter and, by the time I was in year 12, I was the, the arm wrestling champion, so to speak. <laughs> that, was, um, that was a funny test of might and strength in our high school anyway. And it was, it was pretty funny to see uh, see people going at it and, um, and you know, arm wrestling and that defined how, how strong we were, which is a crack up when I look back now. But um, it's massive overseas. Uh, yeah, look, when I finished school and school was something that I'm an intelligent man, intelligent person, and I know what it is that I want to get after. And, and I've got um, a lot of folks and ability to get that, but school never completely resonated with me. I'm not sure if it's the system or the structure. Um, I'm not a huge fan. That's for maybe another day or another episode, but not a, not a huge fan of the structure or as it sits or, or at least the, the pressures on that is a measurement or a metric to gauge your success, especially for kids heading into university and all the stresses. And it's hard. Like I don't feel like I was an adult till I was in my late twenties to be fair with a little bit of experience under my belt and um, a little bit, and I was a pretty mature guy anyway, but a little bit more maturity in, in age. And you know, there's a lot of pressure on, on kids at that age. So for me, my, my UAI um, was, I think that's what it was called at the time was 30.3. Like it was horrible. It was, you know, right down there um, and, and leaving school, continuing to train and get fit and healthy and doing some part-time work. I uh, decided to take up rugby league. I played a year um, back when I was 13 and had a stint with that just on the bench in Division 4 or something. And uh, we ended up winning the comp. I don't even remember playing or doing any of that sort of stuff. So rugby league was still reasonably new to me and being fit and quite big and strong from years of weight training at that stage. Uh, I thought oh, I'll try my hand. And it was a team that won it the year before in C grade, which is my local my local sport out, um, or local grade out at Penrith, which is where I, where I grew up and spent a bulk of my life to date and it was the St Mary's Saints so I thought well I'll try with them and just jumped on with a pre-season training team and I was very very fit at the time from all the training I did and just um, ripped in and and I guess really in, uh, impressed the coaches and it was something that at that time um, Cass uh, Troy Castle took me under his, his belt and under his wing and, um, and and yeah took me on board and I was I was blessed for the opportunity and, and started in the forwards and moved into front row and um, then moved from the bench into starting and, and had an awesome year. We made the grand final. We lost to the brothers or St. Dominic's as they used to be called. Also another, another very strong club and uh, had a few different teams to troll with, but ended up with the Penrith Panthers in the Jersey flag. That's the, uh, the under twenties, uh, which is amazing. And then made it through that squad and started on the bench, progressed into and, and all of a sudden I'm getting called up for reserve grade. I'm like, holy, holy shit. I'm like one, one step away from first grade in, in less than 18 months. It was amazing. I couldn't believe it. And, um, but it was that belief, almost that, that naivety or, or people looking at going, um, just that, uh, I guess to a degree, people might look at that as a delusional optimism that you, you can have. And, and just remembering those thoughts that dad said to me, um, uh, the words that dad spoke that you can achieve anything if you put mind to it. And I just kept going. Like failure wasn't an option for me. It didn't matter what hurdle I, I come across or what obstacle was in my way. I was going to get over it and get, get on top and move forward. And, uh, the first uh, reserve grade game that I played, I hurt my AC joint, which is a little um, little sort of sectional area above the shoulder there and put me out for a few weeks and went back to Jersey flag. And by then, confidence through the roof. I was crushing Jersey flag, so got called up again to reserve grade. And, and uh, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty, amazing, pretty amazing year. And from there, 
I progressed into reserve grade and I, uh, <laughs> so funny, one day I rocked up at the wrong, wrong day uh, of pre-season and I was actually with first grade and, and um, you know, the, the, the coaches were there and all the first graders were there, like Joel Clinton and Tony Pulitore and Trent Waterhouse and a lot of the boys I looked up to as, as heroes and it was uh, a year after they'd won the comp, because it was the end of 2004, heading into 2005, and they won it in 03. And uh, I just sort of starstruck and couldn't believe I was there. And and uh, I was there and they said, oh, you're here at the wrong time. You're supposed to come at the afternoon on this day. I was like, oh, no. And the coach and the trainer said, oh, just, just bring him in. He can train with us today. And that day, oh, man, I trained like my life depended on it and ripped in and again impressed the coach and got to do the entire preseason with first grade, which was awesome. Then came into reserve grade and was moving forward and moving on and up and, and trials, killing it and playing the games, doing really well. And Unfortunately, at that stage, uh, I can't remember if it was around six or around seven, um, I had a head clash with, with an Islander fella from Newtown Jets and couldn't believe it, like just bang, cr- uh, shattered the jaw three places, fractured my cheekbone two places. And I was out, I was like, oh man, this is, this is killing me. First major injury I'd had and I had an operation and, and there were braces that they wired into my gums and then from there they had rubber bands and for 12 weeks I had this this face that was just you know banded shut and it was a killer like I had to learn how to talk with my mouth uh shut which was pretty <laughs> pretty hard as it probably sounds different for you guys listening on the podcast and um it was it was an amazing time because I got approached by the Dragons they wanted to sign me Nathan, Nathan Brown was the coach at the time and then the Panthers were and I'm stuffing me around a little bit and they come in last minute, but I'd already committed to the dragons and signed with them. And 12 weeks later, after drinking through a straw, dropping all this weight, not knowing where my future lied, I end up signing with the dragons and the big move to Wollongong was going to happen because they're obviously some George Illawarra dragons. And, uh, it was pretty, it was a pretty tough period of my, my life. I you know, I won't deny that, you know, having my mouth wide shut for 12 weeks and, and drinking through a straw, uh, it was hard work. I dropped so much weight. It was hard to keep my, my strength up. I wasn't sure my ability or what I would come back with when I played footy. And I got desperate. Like I'm talking like blending up hot dogs and just drinking hot dogs through a straw, you know, and it actually tasted like a nice, delicious hot dog. The mustard, the sauce, everything, it all went in there. And I remember telling mum, I need something. I'm sick of just having protein shakes and, and Metamucil to try and keep me regular. And, uh, and mum ended up blending me steaks and one time I had pizza blended up with a bit of water. Uh, disgusting, I know, but you wouldn't believe it actually tasted delicious. And I think people don't realise take how much they take it for granted when you can't actually eat food. You know, you've got to drink through a straw for three months. Um, it's pretty, pretty hard yak and all this pressure build up through my eardrum. Like it was hard work. I lost my face, my jawline, those muscles on the side there. It was, it was yeah, it was a really tough period. And um, it's amazing how the universe works. I wanted to line this guy up and get stuck in him. I went to put a big hit on him and my actual comeback game was against the Newtown Jets. The exact same guy I ran up, put a big hit on him. And in the, um, in that moment of that big hit, I fractured my cheek again. I couldn't believe it. I was like, Oh shit, what's going on? Maybe they were the signs. I look back now, like maybe they were, I should have given up the sport, but I couldn't believe it. Same bloke, first game back three months down the track and bang, fractured my cheeks. I was out for a period of time then didn't need an operation. Thank God. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty traumatic to be fair because I'd signed with the dragons, didn't know where I stood. Um, the Panthers as people do, I guess, are invested in people that they're paying money for and who looking to the future. I didn't get um, a run anymore. I was sort of put back on the bench and wasn't looked at for first grade and whatnot and moved to Wollongong was a pretty challenging period of my life and lots to go through every little bit and you know, all the bits and pieces, but I moved down there, bought a home. Uh, my first place was a unit and um, had a, an off season or pre-season with the Dragons and it was looking good. I love Brownie. He was a real genuine bloke and real open and honest with me. So I connected quite well with him. And uh, the first first grade trial against the Bulldogs, I did my knee. Got a hospital pass and then bang, she snapped. So that was that year gone. And and uh, Wayne Bennett came in the next year and um, I'll, uh, yeah, I looked at that and new coach and new players and coming back from a knee reco and it was amazing because it really was a tough year in 08 for me because when I had the knee done my shoulder was a little bit niggly and they looked at it like oh there's a little labral tear which is a tear at the back of the shoulder joint They're like we'll go in there now that you're out with your knee so literally within a month I'm, I'm kicking back with my leg up laying on the bed and then my arms in a sling I had a knee and shoulder full reconstructions on both because they when they went in there some stuff going on and Geez, that rocked me. Like I'm laying down with my arm sling, my leg up. Didn't sleep that year, that's for sure. Um, probably prepped me, uh, prepped me 
nine years earlier for childhood um, and uh, having kids and not sleeping then. But that was rough. That was really, really rough trying to rehab my knee. I don't have full range back on my knee. The shoulder's good. I can move it around now. And I've, you know, since then, um, I had another Rico and it was a tough period of my life because I went from there to not connecting with Wayne Bennett at all. I, you know, it's, um, everyone has different connections with different people. And if you're a match, great. If you're not, is what it is. We certainly aren't a match. And, and I'll be truthful and honest with that. Um, you know, he has his style and his way. And, and I have my style and my way of being interacting and creating connections and relationships. And, um, and you know, I, I did not get along with him at all. And that is, is what it is. So my career ended there with the Dragons. And from there, I had nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. And, and with repayments and other things, I, I lost, lost my home. I had no contract, no, no money. I was working my PT on the side. I've done that since I was 18, just some side stuff, training family, friends and, and clients. So I was doing that as well, still remotely and whatnot. But that was hard because my dreams were shattered. And I was like, oh, here we go. I'm not getting a run and this isn't happening. And I'm having all these operations. Had another knee arthroscopy at the end of um, at the end of uh, 09. So that was like another year, another operation. Then 2010. And then I went back and I played with the Magpies. Amazing year with the guys in reserve grade there. I was living in a shack in Liverpool where I was getting electrocuted by the uh, by the handles of the showers and, and living with James Sharkey, one of, one of my best mates now. And um, yeah, it was a horrible little type for living in. And like I said, I lost my home, didn't have anywhere to live. And then I moved in with Nan and Pop. It was just a whole whirlwind of a period of time. Started working with my brothers who owned, um, owned a pool business and I was uh, laboring then and then became the, uh, the head pool installer. And it was just a whole whirlwind of, of emotion. I didn't know where I stood, you know, what was next and kept dangling the carrot of that, you know, dangling for myself and going, I can get there, you know, I can still come back, I can make it. And Busted my elbow, so I had an elbow operation as well at the end of that year in 2010 and 2011. Um, retired and then came back out of um, retirement to play with with the Bunnies and I was on the bench a few times as 18th man with them and and uh, that never come to fruition. I did have a contract with them for 2012 to still be there. So you can see this period of years, I'm just, I'm chasing, I'm chasing. I'm still doing my PT on the side. I'm still working for my brothers in the pool game and, and uh, geez, I was driving about 1,800 Ks a week because I was living with Nan and Pop at the time and driving around either Northern Beaches or Liverpool when I was with the Magpies and then working with my brothers on the Northern Beaches. And it was, geez, it was a traumatic time. I don't know if I could do it now. It's, um, it was pretty hard back then, but I just didn't think about it again. Just that optimism of I can get there, I can do it. And collectively over the whole experience, it all come to an end when I went and played for Italy, being half Italian in the Rugby League World Cup qualifiers in 2011. And we played... Uh, over in Italy and in Serbia, then it was an amazing experience. I love it. And looking back in, uh, you know, playing against Serbia and Russia and Lebanon, Lebanon was the last game in that game against Lebanon. And they were a fierce team and we only just won and we ended up making it through, but I didn't even get to see that because underneath the tackle about 10 minutes in, I popped my shoulder again and it was done and raised off to the ambulance. They're jabbing me with stuff to try and make the pain and go away. I'm not feeling any change in that. The pain was real. And before I know it, I'm sitting there on the other side of the world in this hospital, which Serbia is a beautiful country, but geez, there's some war-torn places. And where I went, it, it certainly wasn't um, an ideal place. There were people you know, where, where people were getting looked after um, or just the, the current way that it was. You know, I'm in there and there's, there's people bloodied up and it was like a, a war zone in this, in this hospital. And um, we, with all these different people that thing going on in their life and what was happening then I'm sitting there with this big fella with footy shorts on and socks and my arms popped out man I've never felt more away more alone and, and further away from home that was that was something else that was a tough that was a really tough moment I'm sitting the shoulder was still out it was out for three hours there was a doctor there one of them spoke English thank god and he popped it back in for me but that period of time there that's when I knew it was over um, that's when I knew that my career was done and I lost. I knew I'd lose my contract with Souths because I'd have to pass the medical when I got home, and that obviously wasn't going to happen. Then I, you know, bandaged it up, and no one was with me. Crin, my wife, girlfriend at the time, she was back home, and it was it was just away with the with the club and, and the um the team. And uh, I got back home, and yeah, failed my medical, lost my contract, and that was the end of 2011. I had gotten my CrossFit certification at the time. Uh, at that stage, I'd had eight operations and reconstructions, um, three on the knee, two on the shoulder, because I had it reconstructed, one on the elbow, two on the jaw and face. And man, what a, uh, what a time, 20, 25 years of age. Um, you know, it was, 
it was all uh, all but over 26 years of age sorry in 2011 and I had a, a friend of mine that I decided to why not let's go for it let's do it and we decided to open a gym together <laughs> and, and you know it, it it's something that never ended for me, having that love and passion for people. It's, it's funny how you look back in your life and you just see signs, you see things that are always there. And regards to the footy and the fame, the glory, the money, all the, all the not wrong reasons, but different reasons in which I was trying to chase greatness in my own right. But coming from a level of self-drive, self-belief and challenging myself, because that is at the crux of who I am from where I've been and who I've become in being that little fat boy who couldn't do anything to where I was, you know, and that really drives me. It wasn't the money, the fame, the glory, but they were some of the tangibles I was looking at and looking for in the pathway of playing professional sport. And I thought, why not start this gym? And we started CrossFit Wellbeing and it was it was amazing. It was just a, an unbelievable opportunity that I had um, from which I had no idea about business, what to do, where, where to turn next, how to make any money. So the opportunity was, was an amazing thing for me to move forward in. But um, in terms of money, made no money, zero money in that. And it was, it was a tough time racking up credit card bills and debts and living off Corinne and her wages. And this was a pretty, pretty tough period of our, our lives. And looking at that and trying to still be that elite athlete, because there was that at the time, I look back now, there's that void that needed to be filled you know, rugby league was torn away from me. I didn't know any better at that time. And, and I wanted to be an elite athlete and fast forwarding over a few years, I played, um, I, sorry, I, I made the regionals, which is like the top in the country or top in Australia, New Zealand, three years in a row, 2013, 14, 50, and all, 15, all the while still running CrossFit wellbeing and, and, um, getting married at that time as well. And so many different things going on, moving home seven times in that four year period. Like there's just so much, um, so much instability. I look back now and it's okay because that, that has really shaped me towards who I am and, and having someone stable like Corinne and what she was doing really balanced out what we were, what we had and, and, and that cohesion in me getting after different things and, and, and testing the waters, which I believe is absolutely the time to do it in, in your twenties. And I look back now and there's so many different ways you can look at it. Like my, my life was a waste I lost my twenties to injury and, and career and having no money, losing my home, nearly being homeless, living in a shack, getting electrocuted, then living and moving in with Nan and Pop. Um, mum and dad were in Queensland at the time. Thank God Nan and Pop took me under there and their wing and let me live with them out at Glenmore Park. All these different things happening. And it really has given me a level of resilience and persistence in, in overcoming adversity and the challenge that we face in life. But at the stage, we, we looked in 2015 with the help of Quinn's parents to move up into the Central Coast and, and, and buy our first home. And here we are a few years later, still living on the coast. And, you know, I had, had the opportunity to buy CrossFit Royal Commander off a friend and, and I did that. And, and here we are. I've had the gym for three years now and I travel to Gateshead to, to run that. And it was funny because... You know, I've been in the industry 15 years at that stage, nearly 18 years now since I was 17, I've been a PT and, um, and it was, it was really funny. Everything I've been through, like I said, you could just, I could feel that, that tap on the shoulder, so to speak on, on helping people and, and helping people shift their perspective and change who it is they are into who they can become. And I don't see people as they are. I see them for who they can be, um, the potential of what they can have, the greatness they have inside them, not as they currently sit. And, you know, people may call it weakness or, you know, kindness can be weakness or having that, that level of compassion and empathy, but it's, it's there. And it doesn't, you know, if I get rejected or rocked from one person, it doesn't take, I don't take it through to the next person. And this is something that became a realization for me when I entered fatherhood. And look, I've worked with fathers for over 10 years, 15 years now. I love working with older people, older men. I've got older, older brothers. So I feel a bit more old school and mature in that sense. And, and when Stella was born, back in 2016, it really rocked me. I didn't train for nearly six months and I own Royal Commando. Like I, I work in the office three steps from the gym and nearly six months, like bits and pieces here and there, but I was putting weight on again. I was creating excuses, eating shit food and just spiraling down. That little fat boy was coming out again. It was like he never left and, and some lighthearted jokes from the members on my weight and my, my shape and it really affected me. And it was funny because when this was hitting me and, and happening, someone who'd come from obesity and heavily overweight as a child to professional elite sport to rising up and starting businesses, not knowing what to do and just, just reacting and, and just putting out fires and trying to make, make do and make it real. It was, it was a really confronting experience when I became a father and Stella hasn't slept through in the whole life. So nearly three years without sleep, but it wasn't even just about the sleep deprivation. It was just how it affected me. 
and being the best I can be, which means being the best I can be for others and my family. And I thought, shit, if this is hitting me, if this is affecting me, I've been an elite athlete, regionals multiple times, competed in several comps with CrossFit at a high level. Not many people at 110 kilos worldwide can do what I can do. You know, I've looked at, I've looked up the stats. Like of in regionals, I'm the fittest man in the world for my size at a regional level. Like these are things that I pride myself on in myself and having that going against the grain. I don't hold that over anyone or anything. I don't hold that from a line of arrogance. I'm the fittest on this. But looking at that and going, I've achieved these things. I've gotten after these things and done this. And it's still hitting me. It's still rocking me fatherhood. If this is hitting me, what is that doing for other guys? And what does this mean for other men? I'm not saying normal or average or ordinary guys. I'm saying guys who aren't in the industry, guys who maybe haven't had the transformation I've had, guys who don't have the level of education or knowledge in the health and fitness game and how to train themselves and food, nourishing the body and the headspace, the mindset, overcoming adversity. What does this mean for those dads out there who aren't getting that support? I'm not saying I'm the only person helping fathers, other people are, but as a whole, in bigger picture stuff, really providing that support. And there's some amazing programs out there that provide that, that level of support for fathers in, in a, a social networking sense. But I thought, who's really, really helping dads believe again, create that shift in their identity? Because life is change. Life will always be change. The only one thing that is the same is change. And if you think you're not changing, well, you are. You're becoming worse. You either expand or contract. And if you're not expanding, you're contracting. If you're the same person day in, day out, well, you're robbing future present moments of who you can become with who you currently already are, the version that you've already become. You already, you've already done that. You've ticked that box. And, and, and as, as people in, in this community and in a global sense, we get stuck in this rat race, in this, in this rut or, or this sort of wheel and cycle of not being able to break out and break that shift. And this is affecting fathers like, well, who's helping them? Like, this has been so hard for me. Who's helping them? And then when we looked at having our, our second child, who's now in this world, Lillian, I thought, you know what? I, I can't just get this through doing a bit of online coaching here and there and through my physical site, my gym with, with Raw Commando. There needs to be something. And I've known Lynn, he's my coach, uh, Lynn Trin, phenomenal guy, unbelievable. He, he's relentless in helping people expand and have that reach in the online space. And, um, you know, credit, credit to him for taking me on board. I appreciate the opportunity he's given me. And when I reached out and shared my vision and what I wanted to do and helping fathers empower themselves, get on top again, be, be the leaders in their own right. I'm not talking about wearing pants for the family or hey, your relationship or the dynamics of that with your significant other or with your children, but being a leader in your own right, being the best you can be from which everyone around you gets fed. If you're hundred percent within yourself first, then everyone gets a better version of you instead of giving and sacrificing, which is what it seemed like fathers are just doing and mothers as well. I've got absolute respect and love for women and mothers and for children. My passion is children, not having to go through what I've gone through and you know, with now cyberbullying and the internet and technology, I didn't have that when I was younger. Like it's crazy where it's at now, but I can't go and advertise and offer programs to seven or eight year old kids. Like they, they're impacted and influenced through their environment, which is controlled ultimately to through their parents. And if fathers can be better within themselves, then that means the women are going to get a better man. The children are going to get a better leader, role model and father. And I just went after it. And real dad movement was born. Like it's, it's a phenomenal thing. What, what we're doing, what we're creating. I've got fathers all over the country now and it will be global. It will be a massive movement. And, and it's just a passion of mine in, in helping fathers. And here we are now, I'm 33 years of age. And I look back at all these moments, all the traumatic times of my life, you know, the knee, I've still got issues and the show, like all these things that are affecting me and have affected me and all these moments in my life, the hardest times I feel like are blessings because I've come out the other end, the other side. And what I'm doing in the vision and the movement I have, it is special. It is absolutely something special. It is the change the world needs. But I'm not, I look at myself, I'm like, well, I'm not special. This is a standard. This is a given. I've got absolute passion and love for this. This is the gift that I want to give to the world. The power of perception and shifting your perspective is something I do very well creatively and simply. Now, simplified ways that help people tap into changing that state and breaking out of the current norms that are their life. But it's funny because when I look at this and what we're creating with these fathers, it's, it's crazy the role and effect this is having through, you know, the pathway, the nourishing and nourishing the body and moving and training in the tribe, just fathers, but, but the mindset side of things and helping them shift that and redefine who it is they can be 
breaking through that glass ceiling, raising up the standards for themselves, creating new standards they otherwise didn't think existed. Seeing that there is a high level of belief that we can have within ourselves and they can have. This is a standard. This is a given, a norm for me. And this is something that I feel we can all have, we should all have. And here we are looking back on those adversities over the years and what I face, I feel blessed. It is something that I just absolutely, you know, feel privileged to, to have in my life. And, and it's not easy. You know, having multiple businesses like this here and in my gym and, and trying to be a father again for the second time with Lillian and she's only four weeks old at the time of recording this in, uh, in early May and you know it's there's always going to be stuff there's always something happening and I think that's the biggest realization I've had in my time here trying to move forward and no matter what happens the external the outside stuff the things that are always happening to us there's always an opportunity life is a series of choices and where I am right now through being that little fat boy progressing into rugby league, having my career destroyed, shattered from me, lost my home, no money, living almost homeless, living with Nan and Pop and then moving out and renting with Crin, trying to make business do. And, and you know, I, I don't say I failed at those things. You only fail if you completely give up. But in terms of moving forward, making progress in certain areas, financial and others, not moving forward, not moving anywhere with that. But the life experience, what it's given me, and the ability to help people in their own right, in their own life, in their mind, help them create that shift and redefine who they are. This is where we are. And this is where we are. And Real Dad Movement is absolutely the vessel from which we will be moving forward. And I will be expressing that love, that passion, that ability to help coach people and help them change their lives. And that's what I love the most about this. You know, it's not arrogance or ego in, in, in saying I'm the man or I'm the one or I can do this, I will do this. I will absolutely do this. But knowing that the, the humility that comes with it, I'm not changing these people's lives. It's all them. It's on them. They're taking the steps. They're moving forward. They call me a perception coach or an eye specialist. I'm just helping them get a new set of eyes in which they can see the world through a different lens and see the opportunities that, that are truly there for them in their life, what is truly possible for them to move forward and actually see that they can have a life of love and happiness and fulfillment. Not only that, you can't have day without night. I understand that. There's always going to be something that hits us. But if we go for the easy path, if you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you go after the hard stuff, and the challenging stuff, your life will be easy. Because when we take these easy, these easy points or, or options, sooner or later, there's something we can't control that's going to come into our life. It's going to rock us and hit us hard. Something we don't control. And if we've always opted out for the easy options and that hard thing hits us, it will rattle us. It will bring you unstuck. It will take you off your track, off your path. So helping people understand that life is a series of choices. Life is perspective. And your perception truly creates your reality and the actions you can take moving forward. When those tough moments come, we can get on top. We will move forward. This is something I will be known for. I will be known globally for doing this and helping people in their own right. I won't be the only one. I'm not going it alone. There's plenty of people out there who are high level motivators and influencers. And that's amazing. This is what we need in the world. We need this. We need this level of connection and, and resonance to, to find ways to break out of our own thought processes, our own thought patterns and change that state and move forward. And that's what I love most. That's where I'm at. And, you know, I just love the ability of the opportunity to use technology to share this and share my story with you guys. And, you know, we could talk for hours of this and all, We'll wrap it up here shortly, but I'm really appreciative of you sharing your time with me and being a part of my story and my journey and seeing what I'm all about and what I am. And, and truth and transparency is what you'll always see with me. This is what I'm about. This is where I'm now. We're always moving, changing and evolving. Forward is the go. Forward is the key. We evolve upwards. We move forward together and in your own right. And this is something I'm so passionate about. I, I love being here and starting this, you know, First, uh, first podcast. And look, I won't go out alone. I'm going to bring on some amazing guests in the future and I'll be diving in a couple of times a week, guys. So I really appreciate your time and jumping on. And if there's anything I can ever do to help you or anything you ever need help with, please reach out. Alex at realdadmovement.com.au or hit me up on Instagram, realdadmovement underscore Alex Ranieri or Facebook, realdadmovement dash Alex Ranieri. Hit me up, guys, and, and, and find me and... and you know, let me open up what is possible for you and yourself. If there's something you need help with, you need a change or a shift in your life, just let me know. I'm here. My, my life is service and service to you. And my passion is, is fathers and helping them see what is truly possible for themselves. 
Well, I think that's it. I think this is our, uh, you know, this is the end of our first podcast show, first episode. And uh, it's, it's been an amazing time. I've, I've actually gotten goosebumps a few times. And it's funny when you, when you go through this stuff and you, and you speak it out clearly and you see it, you live it, you breathe it, you relive it. You can see the power of reflection in where you've been, where you've come from and where you're moving forward. And also the power of gratitude. I feel so blessed. I don't feel lucky. I don't believe in luck. Luck is, luck is a perceived uh, value system based off conditioning or your experiences to see that someone should or shouldn't be grateful for where they are right now. You know, and that's a whole other episode talking about luck. I, I feel blessed and happy. You know, one in 400 tri- trillion is, is the, is the, uh, is the breakdown, the equation for us to be here right now, right? Um, so we're all blessed. Anyone listening and watching this, it's, uh, it's an amazing gift that we have in life. But uh, thanks again for tuning in, guys. I really appreciate your time as always and uh, look forward to connecting with you guys in the future with more podcasts, more shows, more YouTube uh, episodes. And uh, like I said, if you ever need anything, please reach out. I'd love to help in any way, shape or form and I look forward to uh, seeing you in the next one. Please uh, subscribe or find me or follow me. And uh, I'll be giving plenty of value and good stuff to you guys in future times. Thanks again, guys. And I hope you enjoyed the uh, episode and I'll see you shortly. Take care. Cheers, guys. Bye.